So at the request of our speaking brother, we will have an introductory reading, Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. So Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteousness of mammon, who will commit to, you, commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another, another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. So we will now call upon our brother Ryan King to deliver his remarks for this evening's lecture. Thank you, Brother Brandon, and good evening, my dear brothers and sisters, for whom Christ died, and our young people that are with us this night. Did you know that roughly a third of the parables of our Lord Jesus Christ concern money, wealth, stewardship, and faithfulness? It's a significant topic when you think about it, a third. And the reason for that is, is that no matter what age we are living in, whether it's the first century or the 21st century, money is an issue which the disciple must grapple with. The world around us is obsessed with making money, spending money, gambling for money. It consumes them, it controls their life. And we all handle money, don't we? So therefore this parable that is before us this night allows us to look at ourselves. How do we use our resources. Now, our readings over the, the course of the next couple of weeks will be in the Gospel of Luke, and this parable that was read for us is only recorded by Luke. We know that Luke is the Carabic face of the representative man, the perfect priest, isn't he? What's the purpose of a priest? Malachi 2 verse 7, a priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law of God at his mouth. Well, here is the teaching priest before us this night in one of his most famous and perhaps his most difficult parables, the parable of the unjust steward, which is recorded here in his Perean ministry. In verse 14 of this chapter in Luke 16, we read these very startling words that the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Can you imagine that? That having spoken this parable, the Pharisees who perceived that this message was 
against them, laughed him to scorn. That was their reaction because it was so different to what they experienced. They manipulated, they grasped, and they sought after wealth. Now in verse one, we read this, that he said also unto his disciples. So that word there also in verse one is telling us that this chapter, Luke 16, is following on the heels of his previous parable concerning the prodigal son. And we're going to find that there is a great contrast here in Luke 16 between the unjust steward and the prodigal son himself. The parable begins in verse 1, like Luke sometimes does, by saying that there was a certain rich man. A certain rich man. If you just come back to chapter 12 and verse 16, that phrase has occurred previously in the Gospel of Luke. A certain rich man. Chapter 12 and verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. So here we have it. And the problem with this rich man here in Luke chapter 12 was that he was not rich towards God. Verse 21, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. He laid up treasure for himself. He was not rich towards God. His motivation was himself. His resources, his money, everything that he had was for himself, and he was not rich towards God. Now, when we come back to Luke 16, we have, we have here another rich man, and this rich man owned land, which he rented out to tenants. In verse 1 of chapter 16, this rich man has a steward, a steward. The Greek word actually means a household manager. We would call him today a business manager, perhaps a, a financial officer. And these business managers were responsible for the estate. They had great responsibility, like Joseph in Egypt. The family business was under his control. He had the bank account. He had the assets. He had the money. He operated on behalf of the master. He was really virtually in control of the estate. An extremely powerful position. And this steward here in verse 1 and 2 receives a number of accusations. In fact, the Greek word there, accused, is a derivative of diabolos. It actually means to bring charges with hostile intent. So his behavior through the community, through the village, began to impinge on the master's honor. We don't know who specifically or where they came from, who was accusing him, but clearly they were hostile in their intent. This man is wasting his master's goods, verse 1. You know, that word they're wasting in verse 1 is the same word that was used back in chapter 15 and verse 13 of the prodigal son. In verse 13 of chapter 15, this man wasted his substance. That's the same word. But the difference between the prodigal son and the unjust steward was very clear. The prodigal son repented. The prodigal son understood what he had done was wrong. He came to himself and he sought forgiveness. This man, the unjust steward, there's no way in the world that he's going to recognize his failures. There was the same negligence, there was the same wasting, but two entirely different reactions. And what we're going to find is the unjust steward has just one single motive, selfishly preserving his employment, his station in life. So different to the man of the, the previous chapter. The goods, the provisions, the profits, that he had made, in fact, were not for himself. They were his masters, but he squandered them. He scattered and dispersed them, living large off the profits of his master. And these hostile accusations come one after another. And the master learns now of these things. In verse two, he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? 
Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. So brothers and sisters, there was a day of reckoning. Give account, verse 2, of thy stewardship. And you should keep your hand here and come over to Romans 14. Give an account. It occurs a number of times in the New Testament, and here's one of them. Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. Romans 14 and verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account, same Greek word, unto God. So just think about that, brothers and sisters. I know that we all know it. But in our relationships that we have with each other, our relationships with our stewardship, with the things that have been given to us and entrusted to our care, the truth that we have, our obligations and responsibility, we will stand one day to give an account, every one of us. And so this parable really has a, a powerful thrust, doesn't it? There will be a time when we give account of what we have done with our time, what have we done with our resources that God has given us, our opportunities, every one of us. Quite sobering when we Think about that. So when we come back to the parable, what's interesting is, is that the master has already made his decision. There's no opportunity for the steward to respond or to defend himself. And I think that the reason for that is, is that the accusations were absolutely true. This man had no leg to stand on. There was no point in arguing the accusations. They were exactly right. And therefore, the master made this decision without recourse to the individual, and the steward knows he, he just can't justify his position. The evidence was, was overwhelming. You have to go. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, that as another layer to this parable, that the Jewish people who had wasted the truth that had been given to them and had squandered their opportunities were, in fact, to be removed from their stewardship. And another steward was to be appointed, and that was the Gentiles. And we won't speak particularly about it tonight. Perhaps we can speak about this afterwards. But in verses 14 to 18 of this same chapter, the Lord finishes by showing that the Pharisees were, in fact, the unjust steward. They were covetous, says verse 14. You know, the word there for covetous is not the normal word for covetous. It means a lover of silver has the word philia in it. It comes from the same root as 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, where it is translated, the love of money. They were covetous. Like the unjust steward, they didn't utilize the blessings that were given to them. Like the unjust steward, they devalued the Lord's commandments. They were adulterous, unfaithful in marriage just like the unjust steward, devalued his Lord's goods. They had wasted, they had devalued what the Lord had committed into their care. You see, the Apostle Paul said that the servant of God must be blameless and faithful. And this individual, as he stands here before his master, knowing he can't defend himself, realized that his wastefulness was apparent. Thou shalt no longer be steward, verse 2. That's it. Bring the books. Show me what you've done. Give an account. And that's going to create an enormous problem, to say the least, for this individual. In verse 3, he says, within himself, what am I going to do? You know, this is an internal debate. We're being drawn in this parable into the internal thoughts of this man and his reasonings. What will I do? Well, what he should have done is, like the prodigal son, confessed his wrong, changed his ways, and thrown himself upon the clemency and the mercy of the master. But, but that thought never even entered his head. Not even entertained. You see, a Pharisee doesn't think like that. For my Lord, he says, doth take away from me the stewardship. I'm finished. 
this great lifestyle I've been enjoying, gone. Where's the income going to come from? How will I support myself? For my Lord doth take away from me the stewardship. You know, unfortunately, ease and materialism work against us, don't they? You know, when things are going smoothly, when we have a job, when we have employment, we have a means of supporting ourselves, there really isn't much urgency about life, is there? But when you lose your job, or when you're threatened with a loss of income, when things suddenly turn upside down, you are laser focused, aren't you? And this man was in that position. What am I going to do? You know, there's the, the legalistic mind there in verse three. What will I do? I cannot dig. The Greek is I have no power to dig. So he was not a man who was physically capable of digging. He was limited. He couldn't perform hard labor. And at the end of verse three, he says, to beg, I am ashamed. You know, that's interesting because in the very next parable, there was a man named Lazarus who was a beggar. And he got eternal life, not because he was a beggar, but because he was faithful in that poverty. But this man here is driven by selfishness. He's driven by shame. His mind is focused on trying to maintain the level of income he had before. What will I do? You know, he's very much like the people out there in the world. How can I wiggle out of this situation and turn it to my advantage? So in verse four, it's like an exclamation. I have it. I know what to do. That when I'm put out of the stewardship, they, that is those people who owe me money, may receive me into their houses. So what's the plan? What's the plan? You know, this language of being turned out in verse four and being received is, is really the language that's used in other parables of being rejected or being received at the judgment seat. It's really interesting the way that the Lord intertwines that language into this parable. Turned out, but received. Now, just think about what's happening here. If he had... If he had any sense of stewardship, he would have saved some money to support himself for the future. But he didn't have enough. His wasteful activity means that he had nothing in the bank. He hadn't envisioned this at all. He was just spending money and he was wasting it. He couldn't keep track of his own and his master's. And his sole ambition was to find a place to live after he was fired. So here's the plan in, in verse five. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou unto my Lord? Every one of the debtors individually was interviewed by this man. And, and everything is done in haste, isn't it? Sit down, write quickly. As far as the debtors were concerned, they would have been startled. They haven't even heard the news really yet. This individual knew he had a small window of opportunity before the news gets out. Time is of the essence. Write down quickly. You know, we only have two debtors here mentioned because they were probably just examples of all the rest. How much owest thou unto my Lord? Verse five. You know, that's, that's astonishing. He didn't even know the financial position of the biggest debtor. You know, he's, he's the steward. He's the financial officer. He should have known exactly how much was owed, but he didn't have a clue. It's amazing when you think about it. Now, the amount owed here was rent. It was rent. What happened was that the rich man had this large estate, which he broke off into the various tenancies, so that if you were a farmer, you rented the land off of that rich man. And your payment was part of the harvest when it was available. Each year, the harvest would have changed, and therefore, the payment changed. Now, in verse 6, he said, a hundred measures of oil. That's 4,000 liters. It takes, according to what I'm told, 146 olive trees 
to get that amount. A very, very significant amount of payment as rent. So to have that was a significant discount, a significant reduction. You know, some have suggested that this was his part of the profit, but I doubt whether they would have given an interest component of 50%. The fact that the Lord calls him an unjust steward, I think, means that he was, in fact, just that. You know, how would you respond, brothers and sisters, if you were owed $1,000 and your manager came to you and said, make it 500 How would you feel as the master? Well, we're going to have a very surprising reaction, to say the least, from the rich man in a moment. A large reduction of 50%. In verse 7, he said to another, how much owest thou? Again, he had no idea of the amount. Take thy bill and write four score. So there was a 20% discount here. And you can imagine these debtors would have been absolutely delighted to have the reduction of what they owed. Absolutely delighted. And, you know, here comes the most unusual punchline in verse 8. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. You know, now frequently, the Lord's parables are like that. They have this unusual twist in the outcome. Now, if you owned a business and you had been defrauded by your manager by that magnitude of income, do you think you would praise the steward? What's happening here? Well, the commendation is not because he did the discount. The commendation is because he did wisely. Shrewdly is the Greek word, very shrewdly. So what's happened? Well, the plan is, is very, very shrewd because what it's done is it's really caught up the rich man in the tangle of this whole arrangement. See, by discounting the amount of money that was owed to him, the debtors now would have, would have viewed this rich man as a very generous individual. And so therefore, the Lord faces this problem now of having to save face, because he can hardly go back to the debtors and say, look, I've changed my mind, or I've discovered that there's fraud here, and, and you're going to have to pay me the full amount. Let's, let's rewrite the bill. I mean, I guess he could have said that, but he would have lost face, wouldn't he? And so he's caught. You know, he's got all the debtors who are praising him for reducing the debt. And at the same time, he's, he's found out that the stewards have used, the steward has used that to give an obligation to these debtors to accept him into their homes. So grudgingly, very grudgingly, he admired and he praised the shrewdness of this individual. He can't really reverse the decision, otherwise he loses honor. He's trapped. Now the whole purpose of this arrangement, brothers and sisters, now comes to verse 8 to the Lord's point. For, so this is the explanation, for. The children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Now, what does that mean? What's the, what's the thrust of this parable? What's the point? The sons of this world, the Greek word is the sons of this age. They're represented by the steward and by the master. And they are in their generation. And the Greek word there really means towards their generation, that is towards people of their own kind, the steward looked to his debtors, the debtors received the benefit, an obligation was created, and they accepted the steward now into their homes. They are towards their own kind wiser, that is more shrewd than the sons of light. Now, who are the sons of light? Just keep your hand here and come over a few pages to John chapter 12. Who are the children of light? John chapter 12. In John chapter 12 and verses 35 and 36. 
Then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, believe in the light, that ye may be the sons of light. So the sons of light are those brothers and sisters who walk in the light, and they are the believers, us. So how are the children of this age towards their own people more shrewd than the sons of light? Well, brothers and sisters, they are very, very clever in securing their future. The steward had been very careful. He planned ahead to make the most of his vanishing opportunities. He'd overcome the shame that he might have initially felt, and he was highly focused with the sense of urgency to secure his future. The people in the world may pursue their goals dishonestly. We're not instructed to do that. In fact, the Lord is going to speak against that in a moment. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, we we are so foolish, aren't we? And sometimes we are so slow to seize the opportunity for our future inheritance. You know, we say the world is corrupt. It is. We say that the The world is ripe for God's judgments. It is. But what do they do that the Lord is drawing our attention to? Well, the steward here who represents them used all his intelligence, all his wit, all his energy to ensure his earthly comfort. He acted wisely to redeem himself. What are we doing, brothers and sisters, to seize our future inheritance? Are we going all out to make sure that we are ready for the kingdom. And if we pursued the kingdom of God with the the same vigor, the same earnestness that the children of this world pursue their prophets, I think we would be entirely different people, wouldn't we? People in the world are corrupt, just like the unjust steward, but they are single-minded in doing all they can to to preserve themselves while there's still time. The problem that we have as the children of light is that very often we, we want to have it both ways. You know, we want the kingdom, but we will try to seek security in this life too, through money or through other means. You look at the history of Israel, always halting between two opinions. But you look at the nations that were around them, you can pick any one of them. Take Take, for example, the Philistines. Their god was Dagon. It was always Dagon. The Ammonites, their god was Molech. It was always Molech. The Zidonians, their god was Baal and Asherah. It was always Baal and Asherah. Look at the history of the Jewish nation. They worshiped Dagon. They worshiped Baal. They worshiped Molech. And they worshipped Yahweh too. You know, at least the, the nations around them were consistent, as false as their gods were. You know, Jeremiah chapter 2 asked the question, you know, what nation is there on earth that is, is duplicitous like that in their worship? We can't seek the kingdom of God and yet seek security in this life also. And that is wrong. And that's why Jesus says in verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. You know how in Matthew, he says, no man can serve two masters. But here in Luke 16, he changes the word. He says, no servant can serve two masters. Because he's talking about the unjust steward or servant. We need to be like the unjust steward in our generations, that is towards our kind, and be single-minded. Look at verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. And since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. The word presseth there means with violence. We have to have a determination that almost borders on violence to grab the kingdom and never let it go. To be like the unjust steward who did whatever he could to seize his opportunities, we must press into that kingdom. 
and never let it go. But we often don't, we lack the energy, the focus that the sons of this age outside have towards their goals and their requirements. That's how they're wiser. We sometimes are slow to seize the opportunity. I mean, how often do we say to ourselves, I'll start tomorrow. We're very slow to become focused, slow to see the urgency of the need to give an account at some future time. So the verse nine, he says, but I say unto you. So the rich man said this, the rich man commended the, the business acumen of the unjust to it. But I'm saying this to you, my disciples. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now, what is he saying there in that verse? I say to you, in fact, the Greek is, but I say unto you. He's going to make a single comparison that that just as the steward used the money to secure favor from the debtors, Jesus is now going to exhort us as his disciples to use our resources to secure God's favor. So let's just take this bit by bit. Make to yourselves friends. So here is something that each one of us, brothers and sisters, needs to do for ourselves. It's personal. Make to yourselves. The truth, at the end of the day, is a very personal thing. No one else can do it for you. No one else will do it for you. Make to yourself. Now, who are the friends that we have to make? Well, the AV says, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now, the word there for of really means out of. The Greek word there is ek, you know, from which the word ecclesia is derived. Ek, ecclesia, called out once. Make to yourselves friends out of the mammon of unrighteousness. It doesn't mean that you make friends of money. You make friends out of the mammon of unrighteousness. So who are these friends that verse 9 is speaking of? Who are friends out of the mammon of unrighteousness? Well, they are friends which spring forth out of the wise use of money. Now, the unjust steward bought his friendship. But you see, in Christ, friendship is an entirely different thing. The Lord said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So these friends that we make are really God and his son. They are different. We can't buy that friendship. We are being exhorted to develop a friendship with them. So what does it mean there in verse 9, friends out of the mammon of unrighteousness. What is the mammon of unrighteousness? Well, the margin has riches. It's used of really any commodity. It's called unrighteousness because by metonymy, although wealth in and of itself is not evil, wealth does have the power to corrupt. It has the power to influence us for evil and produce a desire that is unrighteous. And so money is styled there, the mammon of unrighteousness. And, and because there is so much of a tendency for us to mistreat wealth, to use it unwisely, it's called the mammon of unrighteousness. So here is something which has the potential to corrupt, to, to cause one to be unrighteous. It's, it's an enormous problem in the world. And yet out of the wise use of it, we can make friends of God and his son. Now, how do we do that? I'd like you to join me in 1 Timothy chapter 6, because here's really what the Lord is saying. 1 Timothy and chapter 6. Paul said this, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll come in at verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, 
but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Just like the friendship of the debtors, of the debtors was secured by the unjust steward relieving the debts of the debtors, what the Lord is saying here is that we can use our resources, our money, our time, our wealth, everything at our disposal to assist those in Christ. And that's how we make to ourselves friends out of the mammon of unrighteousness, out of the use of our resources, the wise and faithful use of the things that God has given to us. In so doing, we become friends of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are my friends, he said, if ye do whatsoever I command you. And one of those commandments is to give to others in the truth. That when ye fail, let's come back to Luke 16 and see what that phrase is, is all about. That when ye fail, coming back to Luke 16 and verse 9, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now, when it says there in verse 9, when ye fail, the Greek actually is when it fails. When it fails. That's how Weymouth puts it, and that's how the diaglot puts it. When it fa fails, when what fails? Our money, our resources, the mammon of unrighteousness. When it fails, well, when will our money fail? When will it be no longer any good or any use to us? Well, one day when the, the evening shadows begin to fall, like they did for Lot in Sodom, there will come a knock at the door. In the case of this household, there will be two angels that turn up because there are two responsible people in this household. They will be here to inform us to gather what little belongings we need because the Lord is back in the earth again. And when that knock comes, brothers and sisters, on our door, our money, our homes, our cars, our resources, they'll all be meaningless. It will fail. And it will be too late to give our money, our resources in the service of the truth. It will be too late. So what this is requiring for us in the Lord's words is that we must be faithful and generous with it now. All that will matter when that knock comes is the effort and the resources that we have given in the service of the truth. Now, if we are able to do that, what is the Lord saying will take place? What well, says they, now who are the they of verse nine? Well, they are God and his son, the friends that we have made out of the wise use of our money. Like Abraham, we have become friends of God and the Lord himself, that they may receive us into everlasting habitations. You know, that's an interesting paradox. The word habitation there is the word tents. You know, it's used of the tabernacle elsewhere. So we have everlasting tents. And it's a paradox because tents don't last forever, do they? Tents are used in the scripture for a temporary abode, strangers and sojourners. And in Old Testament times, when you welcome somebody into your tent, like Abraham did with the Elohim, it was a mark of true hospitality, of true friendship. You know, Abraham's tent, according to Jewish tradition, was always extended far out to accommodate as many visitors as possible. It was a mark of true fellowship. So what verse 9 is saying is this, that if you use your wealth and your resources and your time and your opportunities to assist others, and you give yourself to that, when the kingdom age comes, the Lord will shake your hand in the kingdom of God and will welcome you into his eternal 
habitations. The, un the unjust steward wanted an abode that was temporary. The Lord is saying that by wise use of your resources, he will give you an abode that is everlasting. And your liberality will be recognized. And he will say to you, well done. And you will stand with me in everlasting life. What a wonderful picture that is. What an amazing picture that is. So the Lord continues in verse 10 in absolute contrast to the steward. He says in verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust, and, and there's the contrast, the unjust steward, he that is unjust is the least, in the least, is unjust also in much. Don't imitate the unfaithfulness and the folly of the steward who squandered his Lord's goods, who didn't realize the urgency of the times. He wasn't faithful. The Lord wants us to learn from the unjust steward that he did whatever he could to survive in his dire need, verse 8. But he also wants us to learn to be faithful in our duties, unlike the unjust steward, verse 10. And to grasp the point, brothers and sisters, that the work in the truth, in the small and the insignificant things, is noticed by Almighty God. The least of things, the small jobs in ecclesial life, the small favors that we need to show one to another. And what the Lord is saying is that if you can't demonstrate faithfulness and commitment in the smallest things, then how are you going to handle the big things in the kingdom of God? I mean, if, if money, if you think about it, it's the least, it's the smallest of the disciples' worries. If you can't be faithful in that, then how are you going to be handled the large responsibility of being equal to the angels in the kingdom of God? But if you are faithful in the small things, he says, you can also be faithful in the big things. But, verse 11, if therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you have not used your wealth and your resources to assist and to move forward the things of God now, then how possibly, said Jesus, are you going to be able to manage the true riches? Now, this is very, very sobering. And this is where we need to look at our lives. What are we doing with the blessings that God has given to us? Are we like the unjust steward who is focused on immediate consumption, serving ourselves? Or are we taking those things, small though they may be, and giving them in the service of the truth? Verse 12, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own. You know, we're being offered the responsibility, brothers and sisters, of ruling the world one day, of managing cities, of transforming society to one that is godly and one that is holy. It's an amazing work, but it requires faithfulness now in what is truly a day of small things, in a day of opportunities that we sometimes squander. And the qualities and the characteristics that we are being asked to manifest now may be in small things. They may be in unseen things. How are we managing that? You know, a small thing like bringing up the truth to others at work, picking up the phone and, and calling someone who may be lonely, a word in season, a, a cup of cold water. Are those things important to us, brothers and sisters? the small things, the least things, are we faithful in them? You know, the opportunities that we have to serve in these times are very often in the little things, not the big things. You know, there's a hymn which says, the useful, not the great, the thing that never dies, the silent toil that is not lost, set these before thine eyes. If you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? 
They are really sober warnings as we think of the Lord's words this night. And he finishes off in verse 13 by saying, no servant can serve two masters. For he will either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can serve God, though, in singleness of heart. If you take what he has given you and give it to others and become a slave to those things, that needs to be our focus because we cannot serve both. We are stewards, brothers and sisters, every single one of us. And the quality that marks out a good steward, says the Apostle Paul, is faithfulness. We have been entrusted with the word of God. We've been entrusted with our ecclesias. We've been entrusted with each other. We have the heritage of our pioneer brethren who have gone before that we've inherited. But God requires of us faithfulness to those things. He that is faithful in least is faithful also in much. Our final quote for tonight comes from Revelation chapter 11. So who's going to be there in that day? Who's going to be with him? Revelation chapter 11, we have the pouring out of the vials, and we have the seventh angel sounding. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And we read there in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18, the nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. And thou shalt give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great. Of course, that's new covenant language, isn't it? From the least unto the greatest. The small as well as the great. So who's going to be there in that day with great men like Abraham, Moses, and David? will be there, of course, but the small are not forgotten. In fact, the small are mentioned first, and whenever that phrase is used in the apocalypse, the small are always first. The little things that we do, the wise use of our resources, no matter how small they may seem, the elderly sisters who keep the truth faithfully in their declining years, little battles that you win for the truth each day, which others may be totally unaware of, they are not forgotten by God. He is not unmindful to forget your work and labor of love. No matter who you are, both small and great will be rewarded. And we remember as we leave this parable tonight that we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, who was always faithful, who gave everything he had in the service of his father, And one day, he will return and he will meet his friends. One day, we will give account of how we have handled that which has been deposited into our care. May it be, brothers and sisters, that when he does come, that we may be found faithful and given rulership over that which is much.